Sergeant Barry Plesser, United States Army, Vietnam. Barry served with the infamous 7th Cavalry Regiment, which was part of the 1st Cavalry Division. A little bit of history on the 7th Cavalry. They formed in 1866. They were defeated at Little Bighorn where Lieutenant Colonel George Custer was killed. They fought in World War II, in the Korean War, Vietnam, the Gulf War, the Global War on Terror. What an infamous regiment. And I've got the story, folks. Barry Plesser served proudly with honors in Vietnam as a sergeant. He came out of Vietnam as a sergeant with the infantry company over in Vietnam. And their nickname is Gary Owen. Gary Owen, you might hear that at times. Um, Mel Gibson made a movie years ago called We Were Soldiers. And the book was called We Are Soldiers Once and Young. So this great uh, depiction of the Yadrang Valley, one of the first big battles in Vietnam in 1965 where President Johnson ordered the Air Mobile Division to Vietnam in July of 65. And, and uh, my fascination with the helicopter. So Barry was involved in all that. He served in Vietnam at 20 years of age. 1967-68 with the 7th Cavalry Regiment. Are there those out there who served with him? I, I'm getting people commenting and emailing me that they served with these veterans that I'm featuring on this channel and on my radio station. So maybe you served with the 1st Cavalry Division or the 7th Cavalry Regiment. He was with 2nd Battalion. So anyways, uh, I'm just so happy to share his story with you today. Barry suffered a lot with emotional trauma after the war. Um, he, he discusses his battle with PTSD in this video. One of my best and most emotional interviews with a Vietnam veteran. I know you're going to really enjoy it and share it with a lot of people as we learn more about Vietnam through the eyes and ears of Barry Plesser. Big thank you to Jim Reels, Lacey Baker. Jim, thank you for your commitment to my work, for helping me sponsor Barry's story. Um, thank you for your commitment to our veterans and um, the work that like I said, I'm doing here in our country. Thank you, Jim. You are a patriot. I've, it's been good getting to know you and hope we can keep working together. Jim's sending me a couple of t-shirts uh, where he put some Vietnam um, words on there. Welcome home was on the back. So it's thank you, Jim, for that. Uh, but anyways, give a plug there for Jim and his work. So anyways, Jim, thank you. I hope to work to together with you again soon. But, folks, if you'd like to sponsor a story like Jim, there's information in the video description below this video. On my website, you can click on the link that says Sponsor a Vet, and then you'll see pictures of my veterans and just include their name in the sponsorship. My website is LarryCapello.com. You might want to donate to my work. Um, if you don't want to sponsor, you can just donate in the comment section of every video. The first comment is the donate link with a little bit of information from me. So. Voices of History Radio is going strong. Over 40 countries now it's been listened to and heard in and it just blesses my heart. It's really taken off. I really want to get this in the hands of our students with this next school year. They will have in their hands living history in the palm of their hands. The apps are available for free on the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store. And uh, you can also listen to it on my website, LarryCapetto.com. What have I forgotten? Hopefully nothing. That was a load full. A lot of history there about the 7th Regiment, Cavalry Regiment, a very historic, uh, infamous regiment. And, Barry, I salute you, sir. He's still with us at 76 years of age, and I hope you get to see this interview. And I'm very proud of you, sir. It was a great time meeting you in Florida back in 2007. Okay, I'm gonna travel the country sometime this year and start interviewing more Vietnam vets. So if that's of interest to you, you can get a hold of me, let me know. Maybe you're a Vietnam vet and you've never told your story. I'm a great listener. I practice the fine art of listening well. I believe in you. And I thank you for your service, and I would really like to tell your story. So contact my office here in Colorado. Maybe we can do that. I've gone long enough, folks. Thank you for listening to my radio station, Voices of History Radio, these YouTube videos. Just share them. We've got to share these stories, embedded in these stories of why we've had our freedoms. And it's no coincidence that as the greatest generation leaves this earth, the tyranny is trying to take over. Abraham Lincoln warned us of this, that something from inside is going to try to take over this this country, not from the outside necessarily, but from, from within our country itself. And a lot of these veterans felt it and they saw it, even when I interviewed them 15, 20 years ago, they could see the trouble we were headed for. And now that they've passed away, passing away, people are trying to erase our history. That's not going to happen. History is best learned from those who were there. We're going to learn from our history. That's why this documentary series is so important. 
and I know there's probably people that would not doesn't that don't like these interviews out there. Well, you know it's too bad because they are, and they're going forth and they're setting people free. People are being healed and helped. Families are being brought together. Family members are learning more about their loved one through these stories. These are walking textbooks, walking encyclopedias. These veterans, folks, we got to get this into the hands of our kids. We have to to let them know why we're free as we go forward. We got to embed these stories in our younger generation. Will you help me with that? I really would appreciate it. So thank you for listening, watching, sharing these stories. God bless you, and I'll talk to you soon. I was in Vietnam 1967, May 25th to May 25th, 1968. How old are you now? I am going to be 60 years old in a couple of weeks. So help me with the math. How old were you back when you entered uh, the service? I was 20 years old. What was the mood of the country at the time you, when you went in? What were your thoughts about Vietnam and, and why did you go into the service? Well, I was a... Uh, I graduated high school and went to Suffolk Community College on Long Island and uh, had a good time. I wasn't, I wasn't much of a student. I, I uh, dropped out, well, I got withdrew failing and kind of dropped out of college and became the original long hair in our area and uh, was kind of vegetating watching TV. And my friend, George Pearsall, came over to my house, who we later became police officers together, came over to my house and said, uh, I just volunteered for the draft. I said, you what? He says, I just want to go for two years. I don't want to go in for it. And uh, I said, well, you know, they need us, and uh, what a better way to die. If you're going to die, you've got to die sooner or later than for your country. So we went down to the local board in Bayshore, Long Island, and volunteered. He volunteered that a, a day before, and then we tried to go buddy system. We left October uh, 1966 for... Uh, into Whitehall Street in New York City. We again, took the step forward and uh, boarded a rickety, rackety train in, out of Penn Station. Wound up uh, in Washington, D.C., got on a sleeper car. Everybody had a sleeper car. It was unbelievable. To Fort Jackson, South Carolina, for basic training. When you went through basic, were you conscious of the fact that you're going to go to Vietnam, or what was the mood of everybody there? Well, maybe I'll go to Europe. <laughs> Maybe I'll go to Korea. Maybe I'll go somewhere other than Vietnam. So the field first sergeant one day said, uh, we're looking for volunteers to be an airborne surveillance sensor. My whole life I wanted to be a pilot. My father was a flight engineer with the Air Force for 26 years. He was a glider pilot in Normandy. And uh, he, uh, I always wanted to be a pilot. And uh, I never had the opportunity. And, Airborne surveillance sensor, uh, the field first sergeant said, I think it's a door gunner on a helicopter. So I thought about it and I said, I think I want to look that up. A sensor is the radar. 
So I went in the post library and looked up uh, Airborne Surveillance Center, and it was an observer on a Mohawk. And you also learn to help fly the airplane if the pilot gets incapacitated. So I volunteered, me and one other guy in the whole battalion of a few thousand guys. And uh, I failed the flight physical due to a red lens test that I took, and I tried to re I retook it and passed it, but it was too late. The, the, the volunteer job had already gone by, and the class was starting already by the time I did that. So I asked the man at military personnel division, sir, uh, do you know where I'm going to be after I finish basic training? He said, oh, yes, sir, you're going to be right here at Fort Jackson, and everybody goes to advanced infantry training here, goes right to Vietnam. I said, oh, Lord. So... Mom was having a lot of problems at home and from dad being gone and she had a, a severe alcoholism problem and uh, my brother and sister were, uh, they needed me home. So I, I said, well, if I can get out of Vietnam, not going to Vietnam and helping my mother, well, I don't know which was the more prevalent uh, reason, but I, uh, I decided to go and apply for a hardship discharge. I was held over after advanced infantry training. Everybody went to Vietnam. And I was working with the supply sergeant, and the captain called me in one day, and he said, your hardship discharge has been disapproved. I found out later that my friend George, who I told his father and mother about how I applied for a hardship discharge, got the hardship discharge, and uh, I didn't. But uh, those, those were the days of, you know, whatever happens, happens. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump ahead a little bit here so we can make right, this a little better. Um, I want you to remember the first time you went in country into Vietnam. Tell me, tell me, and focus and be looking at me here. You're, okay, just, okay. Um, tell me what you remember about if you got off the plane, what it felt like, what it looked like, what it smelled like. What do you remember about that? Well, we took off from uh, Oakland, California, the three of us, Dick Lagaki, Ray Peterson, myself, Wyoming, San Jose, California, and... New York. We all bunked together there, and we got on the plane at Travis Air Force Base, went to Okinawa, boarded the Japan Airlines into Pleiku, Vietnam. I was one of the first, I always like to be first, so I was one of the first ones by the door when they opened that door to that airplane, and there were a uh, hundred something guys down there with khaki uniforms on, looking up, going home and I had them a year to go. And look beyond them, and there were guys walking around with grenades and rifles and dirty, fati dirty green fatigues and, and helmets, and I said, my God, there's a war going on here. And the smell, never forget that smell when that blast of hot air hit you in the face. And we, uh, we were, we were, we were uh, all kind of anxious to get, get on with it. So you were assigned to the first calf? Well, we, we went to the 90th replacement battalion, and all the guys were talking to the Vietnamese girls like they never, never had sex in their life. So I, I found that funny. So we, then we were assigned, the three of us, to the first calf division. We had a little in-country training, I think. I can't remember. Were you a rifleman? Yes, I was an infantryman, infantry soldier. So this is your first time in a combat area? First time. Did you feel invincible as a young man? Well, that was it. You, uh, nothing will ever happen to me. I'm 20 years old, cocky, nothing can happen. And uh, the three of us uh, went all the way through the division to company to platoon. We were all in the same platoon from Oakland, California to the platoon. So tell me, tell me what you remember about your baptism, what I'm going to call baptism under fire, when you realize this is for real and... Well, our, one of our first assaults, and we, I was assigned to 2nd Battalion, C Company, 1st Platoon, 7th Cavalry, 1st Cavalry Division. And uh, our first assault was on a, uh, a night air assault by Chinook helicopters into a coastal plain. We were assigned to, to Operation Bird on the coastal plain of Fantiette. One province, we were test, op test operations for a one, a one battalion taking care of a whole province. So uh, we went out on this night air assault, and uh, we captured a couple of prisoners, and that was about it. Uh, a couple of, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't tell whether they were Viet Cong. You never could tell who was who, who wasn't. Uh, like the guys before us in 1965 in Idrang Valley, 
They knew who was who. But we were up against the Viet Cong in the, our area of operation at that time in uh, Phan Thiet, and we did not know who the enemy was. And that leads me to a question about who are we fighting in Vietnam, the Viet Cong, the North Vietnamese, I mean... Well, at that time, it was communism. Uh, communism was the big, bad Cold War thing, and we had to stop it. And uh, our president sent us there, and we're going to do the best job we can. We weren't there for the president. We weren't there for the country. We were in a way, but we were there for each other. Tell me about some combat you experienced over there. Did you work with the Huey helicopters at all, in and out of landing zones? Yeah. Oh, yes. We, uh, Just give, tell me about an insertion and how, who gets on, what you do, and where you... Well, we, were, we, were, we had a thing in Fantiet. Uh, there were three, three landing zones that we went to. Uh, landing Zone Betty, Landing zone, zone Judy, which was on the coastal plain. Landing Zone Betty was an airfield right on the coast. We always liked that one because we went to... We, had, we got passes to go into town to Johnny's Bar and have buffalo, uh, water buffalo hamburgers. And uh, they, we had a beach down there, and they served Coke, and we loved it. What we, you wouldn't do in those days for a cold Coke. So we went, we had this thing at the main LZ when you were assigned. You always pulled perimeter duty, and uh, they had a thing called minicav. Now, this was a platoon-size operation. Uh, the 1st of the 9th, which was the recon patrol, but recon platoon uh, uh, bubble, like MASH helicopters, Bell helicopters, there's bubble helicopters with two men on board with machine gun, and uh, they would go out and scout around and dig up something. If they dug up something, they would call back and have us load. We would be in a tent playing cards, uh, talking about home and eating uh, Slim Jims and candy and whatever anybody sent us. And... Uh, uh, we were just in our fighting gear, uh, rifles, grenades, and uh, about 120 rounds. And uh, we, uh, we would get called. There would, be, there would be five slick helicopters, Huey helicopters, sitting there waiting with us, with the pilots. And if we got called, we would be called out, and we'd be inserted into whatever they found. Well, on this particular day, July 31st, 1967, I was uh, one of the new guys carrying the machine gun. My friend Ray was the RTO, which I, I wanted it, but he spoke up first and he got it, and I got the machine gun. And Dick Lagaki was a rifleman. We were in the first platoon. Lieutenant Hudson was our lieutenant. I'll never forget Lieutenant Hudson. So Lieutenant Hudson, uh, we got inserted into this area. It was real thick, uh, coastal plain, real thick stuff. here. So we had to go single file. And we're looking. And I'm in the rear of the column with my machine gun in the second squad with the platoon sergeant, Sergeant Wilson. Sergeant Wilson uh, was a 27-year member of the Army, for first sergeant, uh, uh, field first sergeant. And he, uh, we were in the rear, and all of a sudden to my left, there was firing. You know, So I dropped down and put the machine gun about two inches above the ground. And... Uh, Open fire for about 100 rounds. Sergeant Wilson yelled, cease fire, cease fire, stop. So I stopped, and we stood up and started walking forward. Nobody said anything. And then we started to make a U-turn. And we made a U-turn to the left. And here come Lee Sanibel, Mexican guy, big Mexican guy. He was the point man. He came up to me, and he, he kind of had a smile on his face a little bit. I, I couldn't understand that. He said, you know, Barry, you just sprayed the whole front of the column. I said, oh, my God. What, what? Nobody said friendlies to the left. It, I, thought it was, I thought it was Charlie opening up on us. And Lee said, you know, Barry, you sprayed the whole front of the column. I said, oh, my God. I said, is anybody hurt? He said, just him. And there was my buddy Ray with a bullet hole in his cheek. And I said, I hope he's all right. And he said, he's gone, Barry. Now, there, that burned a hole in my brain, the guilt and the shame of what I did for 40 years. We boarded the helicopters to go back, and we were out over the South China Sea, and I was sitting at the door, and that was my first thought of suicide, me and the gun, and then I thought twice. 
I was 20 years old. I had everything to live for. And my buddy was gone, and he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have wanted. Forgive me. You're fine. He wouldn't have wanted me to do it, jump out of that helicopter into the South China Sea. So when we got back, we had a black com company commander, I, I forget his name, and he came up to me and he said, uh, well, Charlie got Bray, uh, it was a Mauser that got him, and uh, don't you worry about it. Well, there was my out, my excuse to bury that Yale guilt and shame. Now, I'm only one of many guys that had stuff like this happen. So, uh, I, thank you. So, uh, so we, uh, uh, I knew, I knew at that time, even though they told me it wasn't me, there were only two guys that fired. It was the point man, Lee, the shot at what he thought was the Viet Cong, and me that opened up with a machine gun. There were only two reports, and that was it, and I knew it. And uh, that stayed with me for 40 years. I lost my job as a police officer. I lost my family. I lost a lot of dignity. The one with post-traumatic stress disorder. I was misdiagnosed in 1980 as bipolar. They had me souped up trying to get my levels right for 40 years, for 25 years, I'm sorry. From 1980 to 2005, I was uh, on cyclotropic medicines trying to get my levels right. And I kept telling them, I don't think I need this. I don't think I need this. They said, oh, that's all part of being bipolar. And I never went to the VA because I had a good job as a police officer and we had good insurance and I could go to the private hospitals and I didn't want to take a bed from a veteran mm -hmm. at the VA if I would have only known and I went to the VA. So I, uh, I lost my job as a helicopter pilot, which I got through the GI Bill and through being a veteran because I was a veteran. They wanted me to be fill the shoes of a helicopter pilot. It was the police commissioner's son, Gepi Wolf, who was killed in Vietnam. And I didn't know it at the time, but I took a chance and got my ratings. And uh, through the grace of some wonderful people, I got my job as a helicopter pilot for the police department, who I wanted to imitate those pilots to put it on the line. Mm -hmm. Did it all in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Barry, tell me, tell me about the, uh, the, the Hueys, what they were used for and, and what they meant to you. In the first well, we, we love the Huey helicopter. That helicopter took us into battle. That was our steed, that was our horse, that took us in, and they were, they were good machines. Uh, Bell Helicopter made a great machine for us. Uh, at the time, God only knows what they're doing now with them. They're, they can do two and a half miles away and, and shoot somebody they don't even know who's shooting at them. Mm -hmm. But uh, now, in those days, you heard that wop, wop, wop while you were out in the bush in the thick and the waiting for them to come pick you up, and you popped the smoke grenade and for them to find you. And they came in and picked you up and brought you home back to safety. Mm -hmm. And uh, we loved them. Mm -hmm. and, and the pilots mm -hmm. that flew them. Did you fly a lot on the, on the helicopters or just occasionally? I had about uh, 50 air combat assaults while I was there. We, different LZs that we went into. I have a book with all the uh, LZs. I have the uh, platoon my squad book and platoon book that I, from all the different operations that we were in, and I have that. So, so tell me what it's like. I've talked to a lot of veterans, but tell me what your experience was going into maybe a hot LZ, the enemy, and then, and then how many are on board, and, and just the, again. Well, we had usually an ACL aircraft limit of six or seven guys, depending on how much weight we, we had on us. Sometimes we carried, the guys now, they carry 125 pounds on their back. But we, and with the, with the armor and everything, we, we, we maybe had 85, but at that time it was just unbelievable weight. 
And uh, one of the LZs that we went into up in the mountains, the elephant grass was about 20 feet high. And they couldn't land because of the big punji stakes that Charlie had put into the grass. So they told us to jump from about five or six feet. Well, you take 20 feet and you had five or six feet. We were jumping with full sea rations for three days, 85 pounds worth of gear and grenades and claymore mines and all the stuff that we had. And uh, we had seven guys break their leg. We jumped from 27 feet and they landed. And nobody, thank God nobody was landed on a, on a punji stick on the big ones they had for the helicopters. So uh, we had to evacuate those guys. In the process of evacuating those fellas with the uh, medevac guys, they would come in, they came in with a lot of stuff, you know, and we uh, saved a lot of guys, and uh, like they're doing now. And uh, they'd come in and they'd take them out, and I was standing on the skid of this helicopter, loading some of the uh, broken leg guys in. They couldn't land, so they had to hover. So we're, I'm on the skid, and Charlie opened up on us and uh, from the bunker complex that he was in up, up above us. We didn't know. And uh, my friend Dick Lagaki got shot through the ear. And the doctors found that very amusing that he came that close. So uh, they made a mail clerk. And uh, anyway, we uh, I jumped off the skid at the same time that the pilot got shot in the leg, the, the co-pilot. I was on the left-hand side and the co-pilot was flying, was hovering the helicopter. And the helicopter did it, laid over a 90 degree, just laid over. At that time, the door gunner jumped out. He jumped or fell, I'm not sure, but I think he jumped because he thought he was going in. I thought they were going in and my buddy Dick was on that helicopter. <laughs> I jumped, I jumped off this skid when I started hearing the firing and then I saw that, I'm, I'm witnessing this. I crawled out outside the perimeter and got the door gunner, brought him back. He got on the next helicopter out. But the, the uh, helicopter, uh, the pilot got it before it went in and he brought it back and they, they made it out. Uh, Are these memories vivid? You want? I'm gonna be gone, okay. Congratulations, thank you for all you did. Thank you. Okay. God bless you now. Thank you, Bob. God bless you, Bob. Thank you, sir. Are these memories, uh, obviously, they're vivid in your mind still. Huh. But, uh, like yesterday. Um, I, I find that amazing that uh, you, a young man can go through so much and then come back to, to, to live and tell about that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be jumping around a bit, but did you feel any survivor's guilt after having come home and, and why did I make it? Or I mean, what, you know, I'm sure you probably did. Well, I, I did that for 40 years. I felt uh, I was living. I was sitting on top of the world, 1980. I had the job of a lifetime. I was getting good pay. I was skiing 42 days a year up in Vermont. I had. Uh, I loved every minute I went to work. There wasn't a day I didn't enjoy going to work. And I had a wonderful job. And I, I was depressed and thinking suicide. And I didn't know why. I had an anxiety situation at work and uh, with the sergeant there. And, uh, but other than that, I couldn't put my finger on it. And we, we had uh, a lot of things over the years that we tried to suppress, you know, that you just didn't think about it. I never talked about it. And then in 1995, when I went to jail for trying to go back to see my first wife because I was spaced out on uh, psychotic and and uh, delusional, thinking that I had to go back and see my first first wife I hadn't seen in 17 years, uh, so I could get with my grandchildren. Her and I were gonna live a wonderful life with our grandchildren. Those were my thoughts at the time. But we we uh, we brought those thoughts back from Vietnam uh, about you always had a little nightmare about. I always saw Ray's face you know, with the bullet hole in it and. Uh, and a lot of sleepless, you know, lost a lot of sleep over that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the VA has now, has a tremendous post-traumatic stress disorder program. And they put you through a 16-week program with other guys. And we uh, were able to come to grips with a lot of things and closure. That's the one word that sticks out in my mind. 
I went to my first Calvary reunion for the first time in July of this year, 19, of 2006, rather. And uh, I was never so proud of something in my life. Is that the one in D.C., or where was that? That was in Louisville, Kentucky. Oh, okay. At that reunion, I met some guys that I fought next to. Mm -hmm. We discussed what went on, going to Quezon, going to Washoe Valley, Mang Song, Wei, all these places that we fought across, across, next to each other. You were getting your ass kicked, and we were get, kicking ass. And, but my platoon lieutenant and I, Gregory Molesworth, Lieutenant Gregory Molesworth, first platoon lieutenant. What a guy. Him and I had the same thoughts. Get those guys home. And we would not charge the hill. We would put everybody down, keep your head down, and we'd call in the bombers and the jets and the rockets and the artillery. And then we'd go out and pick up the pieces. We went through all those battles, and uh, we did not get one guy killed or wounded, and that's our claim to fame. And we were proud of that, him and I to this day. So you spent one year in Vietnam? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously you, you've received what I call the baptism under fire, and you're there, and it's real, and you're watching out for each other. Are, do, you, do you consider yourself uh, like a religious type praying man? or is, What got you through the hard times? Uh, your training? I mean, what, what, what did you think about home? Well, How did you get through it? Well, what stood out most in my mind at the time was... I'm going to do the best job I can do in this, in this situation, in, in this time period. And, uh, and then when you're in a foxhole and the rounds are flying, or you're coming into a hot LZ, there are no atheists in foxholes. None. I don't care whether you're, you're what religion you are, whatever, what, you are looking to God for some kind of guidance, a divine guidance and help to get you through this. And you swear you'll go to church every Sunday after, if you get me through this. And uh, uh, Colonel Moore and Joe Galloway wrote a tremendous book that I read a month ago and cried. Uh, a lot of people wouldn't, but uh, to be there, did that, and know what they're talking about. And the way that man took care of his men impressed me and gave me tremendous feeling of pride and uh, accomplishment for something that I was ashamed of for 40 years. Did you see the movie? Saw the movie 10 times and got more out of it. It's like the Bible. You read the Bible. How does that man read the Bible all his life? And what does he get out of it? How can he? Well, I'll tell you what. You read the Bible, and every time you become a little more of a believer, you get more and more out of that same passage, and you get more and more out of everything that is said in the Bible, and you apply it as you go through life. And when you get on in life, all of a sudden it says, "Well, that means a lot." It's hard to tell the kids nowadays. My children, they march to a different drummer than I did. Mm -hmm. Um. We're going to jump back and forth, like I said, but Barry, what, why did you talk with me today? You read the article. What, what, what rose up in you to think you should call me? Well, I got a story, and I think it's a good one. I'm going to write a book. I live in the villages up in Florida. We have a creative writing class. And as soon as I get a chance, I have, I'm very busy with a business. I have my own business that I'm in with another fellow who's a retired police chief from, assistant police chief from uh, Binghamton, New York, Justin Dyer. And him and I are uh, selling, buying and selling golf carts and fixing them and putting all the whistles and bells on them and enjoying life. And uh, I'm trying to make up for 25 lost years. Mm -hmm. Why did you, why did you uh, want to talk to me today? What, what... Well, I wanted to talk to you because I felt that when I went to the reunion, in uh, my first reunion, the 59th reunion, 1st Cavalry Division in Louisville, Kentucky, July, beginning of July 2006, I walked around and I listened to the stories of some of these men. And the stories that these men tell have to be recorded, have to be put down. I went around to the, 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 the association president and stuff. I said, we got to get stenographers or somebody in here to record these stories for posterity. These are unbelievable stories. 
men dying and getting ready to be buried. And they put the, go to put the dog tag in his mouth. They couldn't bury him because of coral uh, on the island. And they found him alive. He was alive. He's still alive today. Uh, men walking around with saddles and breeches from the horses that they rode in 1938 uh, in the 1st Cavalry Division. Uh, the men in Korea, the mass wave attacks, uh, the bodies piling up in front of them, being taken prisoner, uh, hiding and being le left behind the lines. And Oh, it's just unbelievable stories. And Larry, you're doing a wonderful job uh, of telling those stories. And my story is just another story. But uh, you'll help people understand. We only have 8% veterans and military people in this country. 92% of these people do not realize the threat to this country. They think we don't need ROTC in San Francisco. They think that ROTC in San Francisco high schools are teaching our kids to kill. Well, if they perceive that there is not a threat against us from the other side, from the, from the dark evil of this world, and there is no dark evil in this world, I think they've got another thing coming. And I think we ought to tell these stories that for these men, brave, brave men, and the real bright ones are in the cemeteries. The real heroes, they're not with us anymore. And we're able to tell our stories. But their stories are the ones that we have to remember, too. Mm -hmm. Totally agree with you. Well, back in Vietnam, um, did that year go by slow or did it go by fast? I mean, was it... That's... <laughs> well, everybody had a short time of stick, you know. Well, I got 300 and... 27 days to go. Oh, you poor bastard. I'm so short, I could jump off a parachute off a curb. Uh, I got 220 days to go. Well, you're crazy. I got 30 days to go. I'm short timer. We counted each and every day. We knew exactly how much time we had to go. That's why when we thought about the World War II veterans, they were the tip of the spear. Those guys were there for the duration, some three, four, five years in combat. And I cannot ever think, and the guys in Korea, they were there for the duration, up and down the peninsula and the weather and the cold. The guys telling stories about the frostbite and how they, you know, how they lived. How, you, know, you just cannot comprehend unless you've been there did that. Uh, you can only listen to the stories. And you get what you can out of the stories, which Larry's telling. And Larry's going to do a good job. I, he's done a wonderful job. I, I saw his website, and he's doing a wonderful job with it. Thank you. Thank you. Are, are you... Uh, Thank of a lot of things. Um, you know, Vietnam, just this is the word Vietnam with a lot of people. It, paints pictures in their minds. It's based on hearsay, what they've heard. But So it's been good talking to many, many Vietnam veterans. But uh, a lot of the veterans came back and they, they didn't transition into civilian life, unlike maybe today where they're trying to. Do um, you think that's what caused a lot of the problems with some of the vets is they didn't have the help they needed when they came back? Definitely. Definitely. I've talked to guys that are Vietnam vets, Iraq vets. The guys coming back from Iraq, they go through 10 day screening when they come back to see if they got any psychological problems. Men and women. I'm involved with an operation, family reunion, which is uh, underwritten by the Utility Workers of America, AFL CIO. These, men, these people, my friend who was in my platoon, Bobby Canetta, mm -hmm. lost his leg right after I left. And uh, he, was a, he w was a secretary treasurer for the Utility Workers of America uh, in, in New York for 15 years. The man worked. He, that tells you something about the man. He didn't have to do nothing, but he worked. And he, and he went to see the guys that were convalescing in Walter Reed, and he took care of those guys and gave them hope. Remember 30 Seconds Over Tokyo? When Van Johnson came home and he, 
Didn't want to see his wife. He didn't want to know. He was a half a man. He was. He didn't want to be. A, he didn't want to, to, to see a half a man. So now, he got through hook and crook. He got this IRS and everything here. It's a, a charity. These men are taken care of by their families. These men and their families, based upon need, from the from the Ferris House up in Washington D.C., the, the, where where the men convalesce in Walter Reed. This Ferris House determines the need of the people, who are the family, the immediate family, and they donate the money. Did by the utility workers, and they underwrite everything. There is no administrative cost. Every dollar goes to those men, and those men are taken care of by their families. Convalescing, nine months some people have been there, taken care of completely, supported, flown there, and put up in a hotel, and completely taken care of, and that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And so, uh, and uh, I've just started getting involved, and we have a, we're trying to get golf tournaments and things going for, for these guys, and we're trying to raise money for these men, and uh, get these men, uh, these are the severely wounded guys, the amputees, and the, like Peter Jennings with the, with his brain problems he had. So we're, we're working for also for the 1st Cavalry Division Family Support Unit, which is also a charity. We don't, we get any donations and things you can send those guys, a box of toothbrushes or whatever you can send those guys is greatly appreciated. And you'll get a letter from them. And we, we support them. We're also supporting those guys. And uh, I think there's two worthy causes that I'm championing and I, I, I want to, dedicate my some of my spare time spare time between the business and everything else but I think we we all have to chip in and take care of those men those men are our heroes they're all they're 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 they're, they're making it so we can live free you know and even though you don't agree with the president you know he's our commander-in-chief and he's the man in the hot seat, they made a decision. And every time I talk, start expounding about democracy, somebody says, we're there because of OIL. How come we're not in Africa with the genocide? And how come we're not in South America with the dictators and stuff? Well, let me tell you, we are. We're there. You don't hear about it. You don't know about it. My brother's in special forces. CW5, Larry Plusser, in charge of all Green Beret, warrant officers in the US Army, 39 years the man has him, and they won't let him out. <laughs> he's too, he's too, he's needed too badly. Very proud of that man. And uh, he's done it all, Panama, Granada, uh, Liberia, he's been all over. He did it all. He uh, saved millions of dollars in air assets, air assets uh, uh, getting the troops uh, 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 in his uh, seventh special forces group. He was the air officer, and he did a wonderful job uh, getting those men in and out of the countries. <laughs> I had guys come to me, oh, your brother of Larry Plessis, he got special forces guys up in Fayetteville, North Carolina, where I lived for 16 years. They came to me and said, your brother, God save my ass. That, uh, that C-130, he stepped on general's toes, not, not just toes, legs, to get those planes down to make sure we got them. And he also used the National Guard and saved his, his unit, the National Guard, oh, we'll love to fly to South America and do that mission for you with their money So uh, from the States. But uh, that's a little blurb that he, he, he'd probably, whether I wouldn't talk about him. He's a very modest guy. He don't want me talking about him, but I'm proud of him and uh, proud of our military. Just a little bit more about, about uh, the combat in Vietnam. Were you, was, was it the uncertainty that was hard, the stressful, but also the, the type of uh, engagements you had, were they, were they uh, sporadic sniper fire or were there uh, offensive actions? Well, we were involved in some major operations, but mostly it was search and destroy. Mang Sang, going over, Tet Offensive, being on the bridge, watching the tracers come over, dropping grenades over the, over the, into the water off the bridge, you know, for sappers coming in and setting mines, uh, setting uh, charges to the bridge. We had, you know, 
we had different things happening. And uh, could you repeat that question? Well, just the, the combat in Vietnam, was it oh. uh, offensive? Was it uh, sniper fire? Just A lot of time was spent walking through rice paddies, looking at the guy in the rice paddy, hoeing his rice paddy, smiling at you. You go 300 meters down the way, and he's firing at you, killing a guy, wounding a guy, shooting his mortar. You go back through an hour and a half later, and he's out there smiling at you, hoeing the rice paddy. That's what our men are going through in Iraq. They're riding in convoys. They're right, next thing you know, they're devastated by some, some bomb going off on the roadside bombs. They're going through the same thing we went through. You do not know who your enemy is. And then you become frustrated. And some Marines got frustrated. They took it out on some people. They made a mistake. War is full of mistakes. I had mine, and there'll be many more. There's been many in the past. We had pilot, pilots, fighter pilots say, oh my God, I just shot up a British column. Our pilots right now. So we have to, you, war is hell. And what happens in war? We don't want any more Milais, but there were many Milais. I was witness to Milais. We had to, Callie's built, bore the brunt for that. God bless him. He bore, he, he was a, a whipping post. But we hope that these guys can fight a war and have, when the lines are drawn, we kick their butt. We kicked it in Idrang Valley, Colonel Moore and those guys in the 1st Cavalry Division kicked those guys butts when they went into that Idrang Valley. Even though they were grossly outnumbered, but we did and we'll keep, continue kicking butt whenever we stand up to us. But that counter, that insurgency war, that's a tough war to fight. Mm -hmm. So what kind of weapon do you carry in Vietnam? I carried an M16, mm -hmm. a Thompson submachine gun, which I got, the, the sergeant yelled and screamed at me, made me get rid of, <laughs> because our M16s weren't firing. Mm -hmm. So We've, are, you, are you, Barry, are you um, in, in Plain view of the enemy at times, or is it? Oh, constant view. We, they were always watching us. They knew exactly where we were, what we were doing, when we took off from the landing zone. They, they had a network of uh, communications that there was unequal. They, the men were wore, their men were wearing uh, rubber shoes made out of tires and, and coming down from the mountains, uh, carving uh, out of jungle uh, roads. You know that we would bomb and they fix and bomb and they fix. You know they. The, the, you, you never underestimate your enemy. I mean, you know, to underestimate the uh, Al-Qaeda and uh, all those people over there, uh, you know, the, is, is, is a big mistake, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. Have you uh, ever been to the wall in Washington, D.C.? Oh, Lord, have I been to the wall. Tell me the first time you were there and why you went and how you felt. Well, I think it was 19... 89, I went, uh, 90, uh, right around there. Right before I retired from the police department, my brother came and got me, and I was coming down to see if I was going to live in Fayetteville, North Carolina, after I, I had to retire. I had to retire from the police department due to my psychological problems. Mm -hmm. They let me, they took care of me for a number of years, uh, wonderful department. They took care of their men, and I, 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 I think highly of people that take care of their men. And, and businesses and everything else in this country. You take care of your people, they'll take care of you. You know, you do to them what you would have them do to you. Mm -hmm. uh, do unto others is, you know, it's an old saying, as uh, you would have them do unto you. Anyway, uh, those guys, uh, what was the question again? The wall. The first oh, time I went. The first time you went there, how'd you feel? Uh, well, I, I went with my brother and I, I had, uh, I went to see Ray's uh, name on the wall. At first, I couldn't find it because I was spelling it wrong. And then I found it. And uh, my brother left me there for a few minutes. He said, I, I know you want to be alone. And so I asked for his forgiveness. And then April of 2006, on a Sunday, I looked up 73 names in the San Jose phone book through the uh, internet. Peterson. And I called 73 names. There were 25 answering machines that I told them I was a veteran looking for the family of a friend of mine from Vietnam. I just wanted to talk to them. And those people, 
I had one lady say, well, my, my brother was killed in 65, and his name was Jim Peterson. I said, oh, good luck. on." And everyone I talked to said, good luck in your endeavor, whatever you're looking for. And at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, while I was cooking dinner for my, my good friend and his son, the phone rang, and the man said, my name is Max Peterson. My uncle, Ray Peterson, was killed July 31st, 1967. I started telling the story in tears, and he, uh, he said, listen, sit, and you're very emotional now. I want you to call Max Peterson, his brother, who was 17 years older than him. I called Max, told him the story, and Max forgave me. You talk about some closure. That helped me get my own mind back, you know, not that it's all the way back, because you never really get it all back, but that was tremendous. And I tried to go see him, but it didn't work out. We had some things happen, but uh, I, uh, I can't tell you how much uh, guys in this, in this war are going to live with things for the rest of their lives, you know, and, then, and, and, uh, and it's been happening since the Roman times. Since men started fighting wars, there's post-traumatic stress disorder. Soldier's heart, call it what you want, shell shock, call it what you want. Well, we're handling it now with our guys. Through the VA, uh, I just got my disability, my compensation from the VA to September 28th, 2006. Do you ever think about how you were before the war and then how it changed you and, and now later on in life? I mean, or do you ever reflect on that or just... This is all you know. Well, as far as I'm concerned, I wouldn't trade the experiences that I had in Vietnam for anything in the world. I regret nothing. But I do say I would not want my children to do that. I wouldn't want them to go through it. But we have to meet the need to hold back all the tyranny that wants to be forced upon this country. And we have to do that and let our children know. They have no idea. They have no military bearing at all. And our children are our future. And this is our country. And I forget who said it, but we're only one generation away. I think it was Ronald Reagan. We're only one generation away from being overrun. That one generation, is, it's in their hands now. We can only tell them the stories and uh, hope they'll carry the flame. Because we're losing it. This country was founded in God we trust. We lose that. That's in the constant, it's all, it's on our dollar bill. <laughs> we lose that. And we've lost everything. All the civilizations and democracies throughout the years have not persevered when they became opulent. Every one of them, you name them, the Greeks, the Romans, you go through history and look at those people. And we start doing that. We get this country rolling in that quagmire and forget what we were founded under and take them out of the schools and say a prayer. My God, we say prayers every chance we get, I get. We thank them for the food we eat each day, and I thank them for each day. And we have to thank him for the wonderful things that we have in this country that we all fought for. And the poor guys that are out there pushing up the grass that I help bury. My brother buries two special forces of guys a week. That's his part of his job. And my job is in the American Legion of Florida is to bury our American Legion guys at Bushnell Cemetery up in National Cemetery. And God forbid we give them, we have, we have, there's more of us there sometimes than there are the family at the funeral. Getting near the end here, Barry, but okay. tell me, uh, 
Tell me what the American flag means and represents to you as a veteran. I usually ask people, what was the war that we lost the most Americans in? There are very, very few people that know. And that war was a civil war. We lost, every time somebody was killed, it was an American. And we lost the most Americans in the Civil War. And every war that we fought since 1776, we lost some great Americans. We had a lot of great Americans uh, make our flag. Mm -hmm. The Great Seal of the United States, nobody knows what the Great Seal of the United States means. You look at the Great Seal of the United States and read what it means. And the flag, what each one of the, what the red means. We fold the flag at each ceremony. And there's different versions of what each fold means. But you read some of the versions of what each fold of that flag. We marched in the Christmas parade in Lady Lake, Florida, and watched people sit on the ground as we walked by with the flag, with their children, sit there, not even stand up in honor of it. We were appalled by what we saw. And that's what's happening to this country. We have to take hold and show our children the respect for that flag and what it represents and the blood that is in those red stripes for all our veterans. Mm -hmm. I totally agree, man. It's, it, it, it's voiced every day in the bar at the American Legion. The stories, you got to come there and talk to somebody, Larry, and the reunion. Oh. You, 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 you help me as we go, I'm going to say this kind of off camera, but as we go forward with this project, and as we're going to premiere this in Arizona on July 3rd, you're going to get an invitation. The I'll Vietnam be. Helicopter Pilot Association reunion is in Phoenix July 4th. We're premiering this July 3rd. I'm going to speak at the Vietnam Helicopter Pilot Association meeting this year. Well, you 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 help me with some of these other reunions, the first CAVR, or right. anybody you know, because huh. you're becoming a part of this. Well, we we have we have reunion. I'm going March 31st. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm on it. I met a helicopter pilot mm -hmm. at the first CAVR. His name is Roger McAllister. He sells insurance in Louisville, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. Roger got the DFC for what he did. He should have got the Congressional Medal of Honor, but the, the part that put him over the Congressional Medal of Honor was against the rules. So they couldn't put him in for breaking the rules or landing a gunship in a hot LZ. He loaded seven guys on there, had 128 holes in the helicopter, and took those guys out after he shot a wire guided missile into the, a cave and made two runs on that and got the DFC for that. But he should have got it, the CMH, him and F Freeman got his, you know, Freeman got his, he should, that man, <laughs> but he did. But I, I wanted to imitate those men. Those men were my heroes. When I talked to Roger McAllister, and I said, you got the DFC? He says, oh yeah, but you're my hero. I said, what? Sarge, that's what I, the kids, the guys called me, and I, they said, what's your nickname? And I put it on my, on my name tag at the reunion. And he says, Sarge, his, 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 his call sign was Ramjet in Vietnam. And he was a pilot, a gunship pilot. And, uh, I, he said, you guys were my heroes. The grunts, the guys on the ground, I'd do anything for you. I'd do whatever I had to do to get, help you. He landed that helicopter, seven guys, wounded guys out, they were bleeding to death. After he, after he destroyed the thing that made him wounded, you know, the cave that he shot the rocket in. Got wire, got a missile. Anyway, he, uh, he asked me to go to his flight school reunion in, in Orlando, March 31st. I thought, I was so honored. And he wants me to speak. I, I told him I want to speak to those guys and thank them for what they did for us. Because when those guys came, it was like the heavens opening up and, and destroying them. And I, I, if you read We Were Soldiers and Young, when those guys and the artillery, the guys in the artillery, uh, you know, if it wasn't for them, I, we would have all been wiped out. I mean, we... And that our technology got us through that war. And uh, that was the only thing. Uh, those were determined uh, enemy. <laughs> they were determined. They were determined. And uh, 
they persevered, you know, and we didn't. Well, that's a political thing, but. Uh, uh, I want to. I want to make sure that you. Uh, I'll do anything I can for you, Larry. Yeah, we can network and help find more veterans. We got. We got the Seventh Cavalry Association. We got the first, Seventh Cav. Then we got our platoon, uh, our company reunion up in Green, uh, up in Georgia. We got a, the, the another reunion in Georgia. I think for the Seventh Cavalry reunion. Then we got the First Cavalry Division reunion, and usually they have it in Fort Knox, uh, in Fort. Uh, uh, Fort Hood, Texas, where the division stationed, but they can't do it this year because they're in Baghdad doing what has to be done. And uh, those guys, those 20 guys that got killed in the helicopter, those are our guys, you know. And we got to. Let's. Let, I'm going to finish the interview and then we can talk some more about. It. I want to ask you to do one more thing that I ask all the veterans to do. Okay. From where you're seated, when I tell you, can you give me a salute into the camera when I tell you to? Okay, right into the camera, Barry. Go ahead. Great, thank you. Did anybody ever tell you you look like George Bush? <laughs> no. Has anybody? No. Yes, you do. Oh, really? Yeah. You look like George Bush. Oh, Jesus. Oh,